Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, just uh, before we begin uh, the, with the discussion, I want to introduce a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping points. Uh, first, we have French and English interpretation available. Um, you must select the interpretation bottom at the bottom of your screen and select English or Anglophones. But as the panel discussion will be in English mainly, I will address the Francophones uh, now regarding the uh, interpretation. Donc la discussion aujourd'hui se déroulera principalement en anglais, mais nous disposons des, des services d'interprétation. Euh, donc pour écouter ce webinaire en français, cliquez sur le bouton interprétation au bas de l'écran et sélectionnez français. Vous pouvez aussi poser vos questions en français et elles seront traduites pour les panélistes et le reste de l'audience. Um, we invite you uh, to ask questions to our panelists at any time uh, during this event. Please use the Q&A function, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We aim to save a minimum of 15 minutes after the discussion, after the main discussion for a Q&A session, at which a point the moderator will relay uh, the questions from the Q&A window to the panelists. You are free to use the chat box to communicate with, to all participants, but please note that we may miss questions if they are not submitted via the Q&A function. Please keep in mind this is a public session, so we kindly ask you to remain courteous and on topic. Please only click on links shared by participants that uh, you trust. Be aware that we are recording this event and we'll share it on our YouTube channel and website. And I will now hand over to our moderator uh, for today, Lucas Ronconi. Uh, Lucas Ronconi is a professor of economics at Universidad de, la, de Buenos Aires as well as a research fellow at ISA and PEP. Um, and additionally, he is also a policy outreach advisor for PEP supported research teams conducting projects in the Latin America region. So uh, Lucas, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marjorie. It is a, it's a pleasure to be part of this event hosted by PEP, the Partnership for Economic Policy, and by the African Economic Research Consortium. So um, immediately after the COVID-19 crisis hit the world, PEP, with support from the IDRC, start working early on on policies to mitigate the effects of the crisis. And the, the bar was set very high because this time was not only about producing high quality research, but also high quality research that will have an impact on people living in the developing world, and particularly on the most vulnerable. So more than one year has passed since we started with this program, and a lot of experience have been accumulated. So it is time to learn from them. So PEP is hosting a series of webinars to try to extract lessons, lessons from all this experience. Today, we do the first step and we will focus on, on policies on how to target beneficiaries. Quite an important problem when you are dealing with social policy. And we have, we are, we, we have an excellent group of, of, of researchers uh, to discuss this issue today. Let me, let me briefly introduce them. Uh, Abiba Simeles is director of research at the African Economic Research Consortium. Kibrom Abey is research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and also research fellow at, at PEP. Jorge Puig is researcher at CETLAS and professor at the Universidad Nacional de la Plata in Argentina. And Segai Gebre Kidan, apologize for my pronunciation, is coordinator at the Human Development and Labor Studies Center. This is, a, this is, a, this is at the Policy Institute uh, in Ethiopia. So thank you very much for being here. Let me start 
asking, let me start asking um, Jorge and Segai, um, what were the initial policy responses that were implemented in your country to mitigate the, the, the negative effects of COVID and whether those policies, they target any particular population? Okay, I, uh, can you listen to me, Lucas? Yes. Perfect. Perfect, okay, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lucas, for the introduction. Also, thank you, Marjorie, Jenny, Leo, uh, and all PEPS members for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be, to be here today discussing the case of Argentina and, and sharing the, the floor with Kibron, Abiba, and, and Sigai. Just one mention to, to our project is a, a joint research at CEDLAS, and, and, and we did it with Julian Martinez Correa, Juan Menduña, and, and, and Guillermo Cruz, that is our scientific mentor. Okay. Uh, let me move to, 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 to your question, Lucas. Well, naturally, COVID in Argentina was a negative shock in many other parts of the world. Our economy suffered a lot. Uh, and at the beginning of the phenomenon, the government established a very strong lockdown affecting economic activity, job stability, and income levels. Just to provide one figure, the GDP in the second quarter of 2020 fell by 20%. Okay. Uber increased five percentage points. This represents one million of additional poor people. Okay. So, in this context, uh, and given your question, the, the, the response is, is, is definitely yes. In Argentina, the government implemented several economic policies responsive to, to face the crisis. Uh, and these responses naturally included target. Okay, let me mention two or three to, to, to provide you some, some idea. First of all, to, to guarantee access to, to food and, and to sustain uh, income level, uh, income of, of left well off families an emergency family income was established. Here in Argentina, no, we, we know this, this transfer as IFE, and this was an exceptional payment to unemployed people, uh, to low-income self-employed workers, domestic, domestic workers, and also in, informal people. This transfer was around 10,000 pesos that at that time represent around $120, okay? Also, the social protection system was reinforced, okay? Beneficiaries of, of cash transfer programs receive an, an extra payment, a bonus payment. Here, to, to give an idea, the most important cash transfer is known as Universal Child Allowance, the AUACHE here in, in Argentina. Also, the retires and the pensioners receive an extra payment in the context of, 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 the, of the crisis. And additional, the, the government support production, okay, with the objective of, of containing the, the decline in, in production, the, the, the assistance programs, uh, program for emergency to work and production. Here in Argentina, we know this program as ATP was created, okay. Through this program, uh, the Argentinian government basic, basically assists uh, firms by paying the 50% uh, of wages to employees, okay. So all in all, this package of measures was estimated on approximately four points of GDP and, and, and had been uh, in place from the beginning uh, of the crisis in March 2020 up to, up to the end of 2020. So, so we, we had policy responses and, 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 and nat naturally we, we had focalization or, or targeting to the beneficiaries. Thank you, Jorge. The guy, the mic is yours. We cannot hear you, the guy. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Um, so, uh, you know, my talk will be based on our findings for the Ethiopia um, case study. So in terms of policy responses in Ethiopia, generally the sort of the, the general response has been more of a, a containment measure rather than lockdown in Ethiopia and uh, creating a lot of information, awareness about hand washing, wearing face coverings, covering, coverings when, when going to public 
public institutions or even banks, and also a lot of um, uh, public awareness uh, initiatives by, you know, by telephone, by radio and stuff like that. In terms of specific uh, interventions, there has been some, uh, you know, uh, availing uh, finance and giving priority to sectors which were affected by the uh, pandemic mostly, like hospitality and floriculture. And there has been also date rescheduling for those. Um, another thing was logistic support for firms in the industrial farm, in the industrial parks, uh, as they tried to uh, change production from normal textile and garment to PPE. Uh, and another thing that came late was, uh, you know, Jobs Creation Commission initiatives on sort of saving jobs. So they had some donor di driven initiatives, such as the MSE Resilience Facility, MSE Business Emergency Unit, and also jo Job Protection Facilities. These all sort of aimed at supporting MSE in, in terms of those who, who are highly affected by the by the pandemic so you know giving them wage subsidy and stuff like that but however the scope was very very limited and also as you know you know uh, most of the ethiopian sectors uh, ethiopian economy is is, is in, informal so sort of targeting was very difficult and those informal firms were actually asked to apply online to make their case online in order to get support so, so, so obviously targeting was 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 not perfect and another uh, Perhaps very useful uh, intervention has been the, the PSNP Productive Safety Net Program, which was there and since 2005. So it wasn't a response to COVID. However, it really saved uh, almost a million people from, from slipping uh, back to poverty. So the PSNP, when, when the pandemic struck, uh, the beneficiaries got the, their payment in advance. And also it has both direct uh, cash uh, grant and also public uh, service, uh, public work uh, component. So when, when the, the pandemic hit, uh, both programs, uh, you know, both, benef both, both types of beneficiaries got the money in advance, which uh, actually helped them, you know, cope uh, from the effects of the pandemic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chegai. Uh, the issue of informal of informality is, is is emerging very early on, as expected. So we will have to come back to this issue. Let me let me now ask Kibrom, Jorge, what what was the focus of your study, and how did you come to identify this as a pro, as a priority uh, to inform policy decisions? Okay, um, th thanks, Lucas. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, I guy have uh, briefly uh, mentioned um, some of the focus of our study, but I'll just be, um, I'll be briefly uh, uh, cover what the focus of our study was and why that is important for policymaking. So, in this, uh, in our project or the, in, in the Ethiopian uh, case study, what we did was we were interested in quantifying the overall and differential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Ethiopian households. Uh, we were also particularly interested in uh, quantifying the role of a flagship safety net program called um, the Productive Safety Net Program in uh, cushioning the adverse impact of the pandemic. Um, so these were the, the, the two uh, major uh, components of the project and I think, I mean, these are very much the most immediate, um, immediate um, priorities that uh, governments would be interested to know after witnessing, uh, witnessing uh, a, a global shock of the side of the pandemic or the COVID-19 pandemic. In that sense, uh, once you experience and witness uh, a big shock to the economy, to, to households, the first immediate uh, priority for a government would be, I think, um, understanding how much had been the impact and who had been affected and, and what can we do about that? And we are exactly addressing this question in this, in this project. We are trying to quantify how much had been the overall and differential impact on different households and what could have been done in terms of, uh, in terms of um, prioritizing and introducing some uh, social protecting policies. So in that sense, we are, we are definitely uh, contributing to that um, in terms of identifying um, the, the, 
the vulnerable households uh, which have been affected by the pandemic as well as the role of uh, an existing social protection policy. Um, if there is a bit of uh, time, I can, I can briefly mention um, what we found in terms of our major findings. Um, so uh, at the major finding, what we found uh, in this project is um, the pandemic has, uh, uh, has increased the headcount poverty rate by two to four percentage points. And this translates to about 2.4 to 4 million people slipping into poverty uh, because of the pandemic. And um, unfortunately, this is um, a substantial loss in recent gains uh, in poverty elevation in Ethiopia. Um, and I think in that sense, um, we also tried to quantify um, the, the, the benefit, the, the role of the PSNP. And what we find is um, the PSNP program have saved about 0 0.8 million people from uh, slipping into, into poverty. I think um, this exercise is uh, very useful in terms of informing medium-term and long-term uh, recovery strategies. And I hope uh, these results would, would um, contribute and um, feature in the public discourse on, on uh, the overall impact of the pandemic and the role of social protection systems in Ethiopia uh, and in Africa. So let me stop here and then I'll come back if there are questions. Thanks. Thank you, Gibron. Jorge? Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Okay, yes. Um, the, the, the focus of our study was mostly on provide general insights on, on, on how the COVID-19 was, was affecting employment, uh, incomes, income distributions, uh, considering this policy response. We, we, we believe that this, at the beginning of the crisis, was, was very relevant because the crisis uh, was uh, producing very strong damages on, 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 Argent on the economy of Argentina. And, provide answers to, to how effective the policy response were in mitigating uh, these, these damages, I, we believe that was very, very relevant at that time. So briefly, we, we simulate the, the impacts on welfare at the household level using household survey data, and also uh, we use administrative data on employment and wages. Also, we use a lot of information uh, related to, to, to government cash transfers, and we, in our, in our project, we started uh, working with the hypothesis that the COVID-19 crisis strongly deteriorated the, the, the economy of, of Argentina, also the, the, the household welfare, but the policy response collaborated to counteract, or at least partially, this negative effect, okay? Uh, just to summarize uh, our results, we confirm this, this hypothesis with, with, with our finding, okay? So in this context, the, the, the identification of public assistance beneficiaries in our, in our work uh, was crucial, okay? And, and the, degrees, the degree of, of success in targeting public resources was, was a key aspect in, in, our, in, our, in our research. Most of all, given the, the pile or, or the amount of resources that the government was, was, was expending at that time to ameliorate the, the effect of the crisis. Uh, and we believe that this was key at that moment to, to inform the policy decision process, okay? We, we, we interact with, with two main stakeholders, both of them were official at the Ministry of Finance, okay? And they were very, very interested in where are the beneficiaries of public policy response were located along the, in the income distribution. Also in some other type of characteristics like, like gender and, and, and age group, but they were very interesting on the, on the targeting of public, public policy response, okay? Just to mention one consultation meeting, I remember on where one of our stakeholder commented to us that uh, her office was in the process of, of making a policy report, report to, to discuss further, further policies for supporting poor children, and they need some byproduct related with our research, with our project analysis, um, and specifically, uh, she was needing the impact of COVID by age group. Okay, so we moved to to prepare this this material, and we provided a description on, on this issue, and uh, we had very very fruitful discussion on, on these issues related with targeting and focalization. Thus. 
In our case, understanding targeting the distribution of beneficiary and most of all how effective the policy response was at the time were major concerns for us and, and, and were key aspects of, of, of our study. Well, this is very interesting, Jorge, what you mentioned and, and, and also the points raised by Kibrom, that in order to have an impact on, the, on policies and therefore on the quality of life of, our, of people living in our countries, it is necessary to collaborate early on with policymakers. Uh, if, we, if we just want to focus a research agenda, exclusively focus on the research aspect that without, without working in a coordinated manner, without listening to policymakers, our chances to be effective are, 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 are much smaller. Let me, uh, let me turn now to uh, Abiba. Uh, let me ask you, uh, what, can, what can you tell us about the priorities of the African Economic Research Consortium uh, uh, has identified for informing pandemic policy responses? Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Um, the African Economic Research Consortium is pleased to be in this uh, uh, panel, and we sincerely appreciate uh, our sister institution, PEP, uh, IDRC, uh, with supporting uh, uh, this event. And uh, everyone, uh, uh, thank you for being here. Now, um, in terms of what ARC has been uh, doing, and just to outline a bit on the policy priorities, um, we uh, believe uh, we have found other evidence uh, in combating the pandemic and also accelerating recovery uh, in going forward. I would just say the following one, like all my colleagues and also PEP, uh, we've been extensively engaged in evaluating the impacts of the policy responses on poverty and inequality in uh, uh, about five countries in Africa. But we are also now studying uh, the health financing system in Africa, how uh, it should be restructured uh, to handle such a pandemic if it were going to happen uh, in future. And also we are looking at the um, impact of COVID-19 on the learning outcomes uh, and how it is uh, going to uh, have long-term impact, especially this intergenerational uh, uh, impact. So, so basically, these are some of the research we are uh, involved in. Uh, and particularly also, I'm happy to say a bit uh, with a focus on the gender impact of the COVID-19 uh, taking it a bit further than the, the social and economic disruptions, but also the psychosocial uh, impact um, that is borne by women, especially uh, when it comes to anxiety, mental health, uh, and also violence uh, experience during the height of the pandemic. Um, just to summarize uh, from my perspective, uh, what is the best policy priority? One of the things we've been reflecting is, could African government uh, policy makers, decision makers have reacted differently to the pandemic? Uh, would it have a different outcome um, on both containing the pandemic at the same time, um, uh, reducing the impact on livelihoods? So uh, when we examine, for instance, uh, the extent to which uh, stringency measures uh, and also um, lockdowns uh, facilitated the reduction in infection rates. The evidence suggested that yes, there were a visible impact on uh, containing the pandemic, but also reducing fatality rates. Uh, however, interestingly, the most important actual factors were not lockdowns, but rather uh, the type of interventions uh, as a guy uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, community awareness, for instance, uh, ability to um, uh, governments to spread the word how this virus is uh, uh, spread and how also uh, people should take care of themselves. The reason being, you see, uh, the WHO guidelines 
are prepared as uh, a developed country setting in mind. Uh, in Africa, social distancing, where do you go? You live in a crowded house. Um, and also, for instance, uh, uh, access to um, uh, water, for instance, itself uh, within a family, and also isolation, etc. All of these things don't seem to have uh, traction when it comes to the setting in Africa. So far, we've been lucky. But I think when you do the quantitative analysis, the most impact is the testing and tracing uh, capacity of governments. Uh, and the other is also the ability of the government to communicate uh, reliable information uh, to the public. Now, when it comes to the impact on the economy, I think everybody knows, uh, like uh, everywhere else, Africa has been battered. Uh, at the height of the lockdown, our estimate from night light data approximately uh, was about 5% uh, of GDP. That is a huge uh, contraction. And then when we looked at also high frequency phone surveys in 10 African countries, uh, the job losses, uh, the income losses, and the coping mechanisms, like for instance, re reducing food consumption, et cetera, is huge. So, uh, so what we are advising is going forward, uh, governments need to have multiple uh, strategies instead of just probably four, and which works for their context and also mobilize the public uh, in order to uh, comply with the guidelines. Uh, but generally, uh, this is what uh, we have found. And a bit, uh, if you allow me, when it comes to the recovery, I think now most governments have exhausted their fiscal space uh, in dealing with the pandemic and the economy is not doing well, so revenue is shrinking. Uh, so many countries are uh, facing a risk of high debt distress because they don't have access to international capital. Uh, but most importantly, um, uh, there is also the issue of jobs being lost permanently. I'll come to that in the next discussion. So thank you, Lucas. Yeah. Thank you, Abiba. Many, many very interesting comments, as, as it should be obvious to find local solutions you need local researchers. So I, 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 you gave a, a, a great example, uh, uh, and that's something that, that, that we should never forget. Let me move to the next question, uh, Kiprom, Abiba, Jorge. So based on your findings, can you explain why targeting beneficiaries is so important when designing policy responses to mitigate the effects of the COVID crisis? Um, thanks, thanks, Lucas, again. Um, yeah. OK, so um, uh, obviously, um, social protection policies have appeared to be one of um, the most popular instruments in, in uh, uh, addressing or at least cushioning the, the adverse impact of the pandemic. Um, however, uh, like Ababa said, um, uh, uh, governments have limited fiscal space, and that justifies the need to uh, have effective targeting strategies because they cannot reach uh, all affected people. Because, uh, you know, I mean, this is a coverage shock that affects communities and globally uh, uh, millions of people. So let alone countries in Africa, even um, uh, Western can countries need some form of targeting to address and reach out to the ones which are uh, more affected by the pandemic. Um, so this is the, the very much obvious reason why we need uh, 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 proper targeting. But there are also additional uh, justifications for that. Uh, we need proper targeting uh, partly because governments also want to achieve the maximum net benefit out of each dollar invested in social protection. And the best way to achieve that is by having proper targeting mechanisms. And there is also uh, an issue of um, equity. Um, so you also need proper targeting to ensure equity within, within communities so that you can reach the most deserving households or the most deserving population 
to, to save lives and livelihoods. So these are the very broader, um, broader uh, justifications for, um, for having a proper uh, and effective targeting mechanism. However, um, targeting is uh, unfortunately very difficult and daunting task, particularly um, in the region where we are operating. I mean, in Africa where administrative data and high frequency data is not widely available. So because of that, um, most targeting programs are prone to what we call exclusion and inclusion error. So that means you will have to include people who, who, who don't deserve and you will have to exclude people who, who, um, who deserve. So any effort to improve targeting is meant to, uh, to reduce these errors. So, so um, then uh, we, when we come back to what we did in our study to evaluate the efficacy of uh, the targeting of uh, beneficiaries in, in the case of Ethiopia, what we did was we, we assumed, okay, let's create an ideal setting, uh, a setting which allows us to, to ensure that, that the, we, the PSNP program was perfectly, um, perfectly uh, targeted and uh, it reaches all the people uh, that deserve, uh, mainly all the poor people. And then we simulate um, the impact of that in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of helping people uh, 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 prevent uh, from falling into poverty. And what we found is um, by improving the targeting efficiency of the program, we could have saved or we could save uh, additional uh, people uh, millions uh, uh, by just, by just uh, simply improving the targeting of um, the, the, the program. Obviously, this is not, uh, this is not um, something that is straightforward. It's easy being said done, than done. But I think there is a room to improve uh, targeting of uh, this type of programs to achieve more, more, more targets in terms of, um, in terms of poverty elevation. So that's what we did in terms of um, uh, our project. Now, let, let me talk a bit about um, going forward and what do we need in the context of Africa? Uh, how can we improve targeting of social protection policies? And I think one idea that many people seem, or at least researchers are converging is um, the need to move to um, what we call shock responsive targeting strategy. Uh, that is a targeting strategy that that can respond to emerging shocks, to emerging pandemic. Um, and again, this is uh, this is a bit uh, easier said than done. But this also means that we need to move from what we call the the static way of targeting, and we need to have a dynamic targeting, uh, a targeting that not only considers chronic poverty, but also uh, um, vulnerability to shocks. So traditionally, most social protection policies aim to address what they call uh, chronic poverty. But there, that doesn't mean that uh, this, this uh, type of targets and policies are also effective in addressing pandemics. So. If we want to, to have policies and targeting strategies that also can serve in, in uh, um, addressing the impact of the pandemic, then we need to have what we call shock responsive targeting strategy and shock responsive uh, social protection strategy. Uh, yeah, let me stop here and then uh, I'll come back to that if there is a time, thanks. Before passing the, uh, the mic, to you, Abeba, let me let me say one thing, reflecting on the on the insightful comment by by Kibron. So we, we want to know whether the exclusion and the inclusion errors, if if they are mainly due to a lack of technical information, a lack of technical skills on the government, or if there is a political economy dynamic behind that, which would be a much more complex problem to solve. But let me, let me leave that question uh, for later. Uh, Abiba, thank you for your time. The mic is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, 
you see, the first question is, uh, do you really need also social protection uh, under this situation? Um, um, and, and if you look at what African governments have done, at least from the data um, I've been able to glean, uh, tax breaks, for instance, most of the governments uh, across Africa, they have um, and advise in, in employers to, to pay some wages for their workers. Uh, and then a bit of subsidies, um, uh, rental subsidies in some cases. Um, and then some, there are some that have done a bit of target uh, intervention, like in Kenya, for instance. Um, the reason being, I think, uh, governments find it very difficult to do targeted social protection program for the very reasons that uh, uh, Kiprom provided in, in, uh, in great detail. So, so in principle, I think all of us agree, uh, the needy, uh, the most needy uh, uh, members of the population who are affected uh, should be able to get support and assistance in these difficult times. Uh, uh, but the problem is uh, identifying them and also, uh, how much are you going to provide the support? What is the amount of uh, support you can give? Just to show a little bit of the difficulty, um, a recent paper, I think by Ravalen and his colleagues uh, on Africa uh, showed that 75% of undernourishment, for instance, uh, occurs in non-poor families. Uh, actually, um, which makes them uh, target if you want to reduce uh, malnutrition or undernutrition, and if you target only the poor, probably you are missing uh, almost 75 percent of the people who are old. Uh, partly, they said this is because of uh, intra household problems, uh, distribution of problems. And another one is, um, uh, at least from the experience, what vehicle should governments use? I think uh, faith-based institutions, uh, even um, uh, uh, civil societies, etc., are much better suited to identify the needy uh, than, for instance, uh, formal government institutions. Uh, we have seen it again all over Africa. When people are asked, for instance, during this difficult time, where did you get uh, support? Some of them. Uh, in some countries, say, for instance, they received support from the church, from the mosque, uh, and also some of them say from families, etc. So, so interpersonal transfers and intercommunal transfers uh, are something governments can think of uh, going forward. How do they support them uh, in terms of reaching out the most needy? Uh, because they have a better information about the community. Uh, Etc. So, so in, in, in this case, I think um, the, the other issue I would like to say is uh, really when it comes to the cost of uh, supporting the needy uh, in, in terms of even share of GDP, it's not large. Uh, African governments can afford to, to uh, uh, I think some estimates show uh, if they spend two to three percent of GDP. Uh, they can really cover the most important uh, vulnerable groups. The only problem is uh, th that resource will be um, un, um, uh, the, tar uh, the one just Kipro mentioned, um, the mistargeting and the leakages uh, would make it non-effective. So probably innovative ways of reaching out to the vulnerable groups would be, uh, I think, more effective. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Abiba. Jorge, the mic is yours. Try to be brief. We are running out of time. Sure, sure, Luca, many thanks. Uh, well, despite of our result, I think that, that the, the, the answer is common sense, given that to mitigate the, the crisis, the policy response must identify the, the who suffer the most. So, so targeting beneficiary is very, very important when you are designing uh, policy responses. So you need a, a very, very good targeting because it's, this is the key to, to reverse the, the damages uh, related with a negative job on, on, on the economy. However, as, as, as 
uh, Kibron mentioned, implementing the, 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 the policy response uh, and, and the targeting is extremely complex. Okay, and, and faces many challenges. As you also mentioned, Lucas, you, you have the inclusion and exclusion error uh, around the corner. So you, you must effectively reach to those to those beneficiaries. Just to mention something related with our results in Argentina, more than 10 million people receive some kind of public cash transfer. Okay, and and, and around nine million receive the IFE, for example. Okay. And, and when we interact with the, the, the stakeholders, the, the crucial question there was how those beneficiaries were distributed along the income distribution, okay? So in our research, we, we show that the, the, the AWACHA and the IFE were, were the two most pro poor cash transfers, okay? This is a very well-established fact here in Argentina too, but by some of the papers, 85% of the beneficiaries are at the bottom 40 of the income distribution. And naturally, I, we, we think that this is related with the, the, the eligibility criteria for this for those cash transfers. Okay, if you, you we, we mentioned informal informal workers, unemployed people, low income self employed workers, and, and, and here in Argentina, and also in line with uh, the SIGA I mentioned, we have relatively high informality. Forty percent of the population is informal. Uh, and, and, and informal workers are in the bottom of the income distribution. So logically, the, the, the benefits associated with the IFE, for example, tend to be poor. Just to wrap up, and, and, and I agree with many points that I mentioned Kibron and Sigay, uh, the role of, of policy responses and, and, and targeting the beneficiary is crucial. Okay, and here in Argentina, based on our research, we have evidence, evidence for, for supporting this, this idea. Okay, in Argentina, negative effects were ameliorated as a, as a consequence of, of relatively well targeted policy response. Okay, the, the, the targeting was not per, was not perfect. That Siga I mentioned uh, in, in, in relating uh, his study, but because we have some leakages through pensioners, some details, but policy response and targeting beneficiaries uh, is crucial in, in this type of in, when designing policy responses. Thank you, Jorge. Let's move to our last question. Let me ask Segai, Jorge, Aviva. What are, in your opinion, the key challenges ahead for the government? Uh, thanks again, uh, Luca. Um, so uh, as mentioned by Abebe, Kebrom, Jorge, um, the key challenge now is there is limited fiscal space and in the Ethiopian case, uh, it's exacerbated by war, which also you know, brings reallocation of resources and also decrease in, in donor uh, support in the country. So it's particularly challenging in Ethiopia, but it's a challenge uh, in many countries, in, in Africa especially. Uh, another challenge is, uh, you know, that we've been talking about is informality, uh, which makes targeting very difficult. Um, you know, most of our interventions uh, have been based on sort of ad hoc or based on the very obvious. So like uh, because of the overall um, lockdown, uh, hospitality was affected and it was very visible. So government somehow attempted to support. However, other sectors like rural areas uh, who were actually affected uh, by the supply chain disrup disruption, by increase in prices, uh, were not really, uh, you know, uh, uh, a target. So, so the fact that uh, most most sectors in Ethiopia, especially in rural area, about ninety percent of uh, the sectors is, is agriculture, self-employment, informality. So, uh, so that that really is 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 a very difficult challenge going forward. So, innovative ways like uh, Kebrom was uh, mentioning. Uh, like those proactive uh, ways uh, uh, would be would be crucial. The the community interpersonal support that Abel was mentioned uh, is also I think a, a way out. Uh, so really informality and overall you know the capability problems, uh, data problems in terms of doing uh, targeting is also uh, a crucial challenge um, in Ethiopia. Uh, but I believe it's it's a sort of a common problem um, in, in in many countries. Uh, so 
limited fiscal target, limited fiscal space, informality, and lack of capability in terms of uh, doing proper targeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chegai. Jorge? Jorge Aviva? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, well, key challenges, in, in our opinion, um, include short terms and, 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 and medium term consideration. Okay, well, short terms should focus on, 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 on how to achieve an accurate targeting of public assistance. We mentioned and we discussed in, in, in the previous in the previous previous question about this, uh, an important lesson of obtaining from the from the Argentinian case uh, is that the more most of poorest households are employed in the informal sector, and this is I think that is a common point with point with Ethiopia and, 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 and some and the other countries. Okay, informality is, is a problem, and, and, and policymakers need to need to handle with with this. And so in this context, relief measures considering informality becomes uh, crucial, okay? So uh, it becomes very relevant, the discussion on developing policies aimed at reducing labor informality, okay? And this is very, very challenging. Labor market policies play an important role uh, in, the, in the formalization of employment. So this is, this is very, here in Argentina, it's, it's, it's central. Uh, Given that, that and, and, and also I think that Hebron mentioned something about this, given that the most informal workers have low qualification, lower skills, and work in jobs that are very difficult to identify for public policies, we need some kind of integrated policy approach, okay? Uh, considering economic, social, and labor policy. Also, a key challenge. Uh, is, is to address the questions of, on how to adapt people to, to the transformation of the workplace. Okay, given that the post-COVID uh, in the post-COVID era and, and, and since the crisis may catalyze or accelerate wider adoption of teleworking practice. So, so here we there we have we have a challenge related with, with previous comments uh, from, from my colleagues. Uh, the, the role of, of of using the information is 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 crucial, okay? Uh, all the information about citizen containing in, in, in the administrative record of different divisions on the, on the public sector must be used, okay? So related to this idea or this key challenge, invest resources or invest in resources and in modern technologies uh, is a challenge, okay? This in order to obtain good handling of the information and in order to, to have the information Timely, okay. You need to focalize when the crisis when the crisis is arising. You need the, 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 the information timely. So also make effort to get this information updated as possible. This is, is, is crucial. Uh, this is important in order uh, to what you mentioned, Lucas, uh, related to minimize the typical inclusion and exclusion errors. Okay. And let me let me mention the, the last uh, finance uh, the last key key. The challenge that maybe is related with financial inclusion. Okay? Here in Argentina, particularly financial outreach is a key driver uh, of poverty reduction in, in low and middle income countries. A lot of literature on, 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 on this point is available. So the policies uh, or policy will be needed to, to help households uh, to receive government transfer. Okay, and also to give buffers uh, or financial buffers to, to spread resources over eventual new way of this crisis or, or future crisis that with, with similar characteristics. So, so I think that we have many key challenges and, and we have to think on this and, and, and provide uh, policy advice on, on, on these challenges. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, Aviva, uh, try to be as short as possible so we have some time for the questions and answers. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just I'll be very quick. Actually, the crisis should be taken as an opportunity, in my view, um, where governments in Africa should think of uh, implementing uh, long overdue reforms uh, in all spheres of uh, uh, social and economic life. Um, the reason being, uh, Africa seems to have these shocks persisting for a long time. Uh, and already, you know, uh, the most countries uh, have been have been 
going through several shocks simultaneously with the COVID. Some of them political instability, some of them uh, weather shocks, some of them uh, price shocks. So um, I think uh, um, the view is that uh, collectively and also at individual level, uh, African countries need to have a rethink of uh, their uh, economic management, uh, their political economy, so that they emerge stronger uh, and better governance than they are today. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the for for the four of you. Very very insightful. Let me let me now read three questions that have been raised. And, 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 and then you can, you can choose uh, which ones uh, you can answer. From Charlene Raga, I would like to ask whether researchers think we can merge short-term emergency responses with, with long-term recovery efforts, whether there are, there are some trade-offs when, when we try to achieve these multiple objectives on the short-term and on the long-term. Second question from Abdelkrim Arar. How about the criteria of targeting? The most in, should we target the most impacted population or the initially poorer? Here we get into some a, a, a political philosophy type of questions. Should we target the producers or the impact population? Um, how about the duration of COVID? Well, there are many questions here. What we have learned in terms of how to prevent and to prepare to face the next pandemic, a, a, a next pandemic crisis. And a third and last question, from a political economy perspective, did in your own experience the policy proposals that you have been working on, did you find strong allies or enemies? Did some NGOs, journalists, political brokers, play any role either supporting or undermining the policy responses so to try to get more going beyond some technical aspects and try to understand more the political dynamics uh, behind these issues. Uh, anyone would like to, uh, uh, to provide a, 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 an answer to any of these three questions? Yeah, I can try the last one. Uh, um, please, pl please, Abiba, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It, it, actually, I was about to say a few things about the political economy of uh, crisis management. Um, from how the high frequency phone service in Kenya, uh, I was struck by some question and the response households gave. Uh, um, Households were asked about the level of anxiety, stress uh, they experienced during this uh, crisis. Uh, and then when you correlate it with the uh, trust they have with the government, um, it's amazing that those that believe the government is not trusted had a, a stronger elevated uh, um, level of anxiety and stress. Uh, and also in those regions uh, where a uh, high concentration of such people exist, uh, there was a huge daily uh, violence reported, uh, criminal activities in those areas. So uh, when you take it in the big picture, I think um, the uh, uh, relationship between governments uh, and the public uh, becomes a defining moment uh, even in combating this uh, crisis. Uh, look at, for instance, the vaccine uh, adoption rate or um, um, uh, uh, it, there is so much uncertainty in many countries in Africa, even when it is available. Uh, you know, many people do not trust the government. Uh, so I think that is uh, something to work on to think about. Thank you, Aviva. Great point. Okay, thanks. I can come in to uh, perhaps highlight, not answer, but highlight um, uh, the question by RR, um, where he was yeah, saying- Yeah, please keep, please keep would, it on. Yeah, he was, he was saying, should we be uh, targeting 
the poor or the most affected? This is a very interesting question. Um, and I mean, uh, th this is a trade off that um, that keeps on coming in, in, in the debate. Um, and I think um, so far, what I see uh, uh, most social protection policies uh, in Africa uh, are doing is more of targeting the poor. And then they argue that the poor is going to be the most affected. So that's, that's one argument that I see uh, coming uh, uh, quite frequently. Um, but that's not a complete argument, uh, especially in the context of a pandemic like uh, COVID-19, where the impact was, the impact had been very much differential across different sectors and across different population. So um, imagine, I think, uh, I mean, some sectors have been very resilient to the pandemic, while some sectors have been very vulnerable to the pandemic. In that sense, that justifies the need to uh, target better on who had been impacted by the pandemic. But this comes in with a big, a small of challenge. Do you have the instrument to identify who has been impacted? So the easiest way that people have been doing it, it's easy to identify who is poor, who is poor, uh, rather than to identify who's going to be most impacted. But in the ideal setting where uh, 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 governments can have um, either administrative or high frequency data to identify who is most impacted, then I think um, there is a need to also pay attention to that. But I think that debate continues and uh, obviously it's not just a yes or no, but uh, I, I like that point. And, uh, yeah, that's what I can say. Thanks. Yeah, very okay. interesting. Let me let me uh, allow allow me to use my authority to ask Jorge from Argentina to talk about the trade-offs between short run and long run. I am from Argentina, and we and this is a fundamental, a fundamental, at least in my opinion a fundamental dimension of policy making in Argentina. So can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs between expanding aggregate demand in the short run and having fiscal problems and many other types of, of uh, inflation, et cetera, in, in the case of Argentina, Jorge? Uh, yeah, sure, look up many, many thanks. Uh, well, the, the Argentinian case is, is, is relevant because uh, when you face a crisis like the, the COVID-19 crisis with this magnitude, we, you need to, the, 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 the theory suggests to expand aggregate demand. But Argentina entered to the COVID-19 crisis with a, with, with a previous recession, okay? Without access to credit markets, with high level of debts, with no fiscal room, of fiscal space. So the only the only tool available was uh, money printing, okay, emission. So uh, this for Argentina was a very, very important problem because uh, at the same time, the, uh, the government needed to attend the population, okay? When, 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 when a, crisis, a crisis like COVID-19 appears, you need to assist the population with some bias to universal assistance because you have a lot of people needing assistance, okay? And the trade-offs naturally exist, but I think that policymaker and here in Argentina we have, we have the case, opted to, to solve the short run problem, okay? Now, now in Argentina, one year and, and a half after the, the, the study of the crisis, we are leading with inflation. High inflation that is the result of the, the money printing at the beginning of the of the of the pandemic, but I think that in in theory you you have this trade off. We can discuss this trade off here in 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 in, in a meeting in a conversation. But then we are, when you are in, in in office when you uh, when you are in charge in charge of adopting policies, you need to solve the trade off and 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 you need uh, and you have no option uh, than solving the the, the short round. Uh, demands. So I think that here in Argentina, the government opted for 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 the short round demands uh, with, with the the limited tools that the government had at that at that time. And well, now we are we are we are uh, 
handling the, 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 the long run consequences of, 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 of this, this, this action, okay? Thank you, Jorge. There is a final last question. Uh, uh, maybe it's a guy, maybe you want to take it. The question is, is from Aleni Tesfaye. How was your research study influenced by other happenings, such as conflict, internal displacement, grasshopper pleaks uh, in, if, in Ethiopia? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, unfortunately, um, you know, in Ethiopia, it's not only COVID, which was a challenge. Uh, you know, locust infestation was another big problem, especially in the east and in the northern part of the country. And then in the last one year, uh, you know, war came. So it's, it's a lot of challenges from all directions. Um, so, uh, but of course, our, our study uh, focused uh, on uh, sort of on the, on the impact of the pandemic. But of course, uh, the conclusions, uh, what Kibrom was talking about, uh, about having a proactive uh, system is not only, doesn't only work uh, for COVID, uh, but also for any type of uh, shocks. So, so even though our study was sort of uh, driven by the, by the COVID, our conclusions, our recommendations, they can, they can be applied to any sort of shocks, uh, be it natural shocks or the sort of, you know, global drivers of change now. There's climate change, there is technological change. So it's very important to have uh, a system which is adaptive and which is flexible to, uh, you know, deal with, uh, with shocks. One very good example from, from Ethiopia, it's, it's not from recent times, but from, from, from early, uh, earlier times. As you know, uh, Ethiopia is prone to, to drought. Uh, so, you know, we, we have had to deal with droughts once every 10 years. So in the past, drought tended to kill more people than in recent times, because in recent times, we have better early warning system. So, so, so Ethiopia somehow have, have learned from those. So, and, and I believe that, uh, you know, something similar, some proactive systems to predict uh, shocks and to, to deal with shocks is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Abiba. Thank you, Kibrom, Jorge, Tsegai. Thank you very much. Thank you for the organizer. Thank you for all, all everyone who participated. Let me just conclude. Um, just as a reminder that this was the first of a series of, of webinars. We will have another one in, in December, another one in January, another one in, in February. So stay tuned uh, uh, with Pep. Thank you very much and have a great day.